my friends, my name is Roisin and welcome back to my channel. So we are halfway through the year, if you can believe it. And so I thought it might be fun to tear rank the historical fiction that I have read so far this year. I did this video last year, at the end of last year, tier ranking all of the historical fiction that I read in 2020, and I'll leave that in the cards above. And I had such fun filming that video that I thought it would be fun to do it again for the first half of this year. When I first thought about doing this video, I thought I was going to tier rank absolutely everything that I've read, but so far I have read 71 books, um, and I didn't want you to be stuck here for an hour watching me um and ah about whether books were just okay or really good. So it's so the only books I'm talking about are the historical fiction that I've read and the one historical fiction that I DNF'd, which is 33 books. So hopefully this won't take me too long, but we should get straight into it. Okay, so here we are. We have the um I have the tier maker up. I will leave the link to the website in the description if you would like to do it yourself. Um so the five levels that I've given myself is Hilary Mantel Good, because if you watch this channel at all, you will know my favourite book, my favourite historical fiction is the Wolf Hall Trilogy by Hilary Mantel. The second is Good But Not Perfect, so books that I have really, really enjoyed but had a few issues with. Third is Had Potential, books that I could see where they were going, but the problems kind of outweighed the goodness in a way, like I wouldn't necessarily recommend these books, but I can see what the author was trying to do. Four is not my favourite. So this doesn't necessarily mean that they are terrible books in themselves, but that they just didn't really work for me personally. Um, and I, I wouldn't read them again or recommend them. Um, but I don't have any animosity <laughs> towards anyone who likes them or who uh, wrote them. And then the final one is Made Me Angry. Now these books, I don't have any animosity towards you if you do like them, but the writer I would maybe have words with. Um, there are some books that I've read this year that have just kind of wound me up. So um, I've got all 33 of the books down here at the bottom um, and I think it's in alphabetical order. So let's go. The first one is A Lady Cyclist's Guide to Kashgar, which is something that I read when I was reading books that the story graphs recommended to me, which I'll leave in the um, cards above. Um, and if I run out of cards, I'll start leaving videos in the description. So, uh, And it, it's kind of set between two time periods, one about a lady who wants to write a book about cycling to Kashgar um, and has gone on a mission and Kashgar is in um western china uh, and then also one set in the present day that is about um a woman who uh, there's a man who falls asleep outside her front door and draws a picture and writes something in arabic and i'm gonna put not my favorite for this um because i don't even think it had potential because i couldn't really see what the writer was aiming for or why she was writing it her writing itself had potential um it wasn't perfect it was quite bland at times but there were moments that were interesting but the the story the characters i just didn't understand the point of that book I don't know why it existed. Next we have A Net for Small Fishes by Lucy Jargo and I'm going to put that one in Had Potential. Um, the reason I'm putting it in Had Potential is because I think that the historical period was quite well done and the topic of the book which is about two women involved in a scandal in the Stuart court um, which leads to one of them being uh, beheaded, no hung, which leads to one of them being hanged. Um, which you know from the beginning. But overall, I, it was much too plotty for me, um, not my style at all. I felt like the characters were a little, everything was quite overwrought and melodramatic. And I also thought that there were points that just happened and didn't really get resolved for any reason. There's also a lot of sexual violence in it, which doesn't necessarily make it a bad book, but is something I would warn you about if you are interested in reading it. Right, next we have A Place of Greater Safety by Hilary Mantel. And although my top spot is called Hilary Mantel Good, A Place of Greater Safety doesn't make it there for me, unfortunately. I don't know if it's because it was so chunky, because I was reading it when I was reading the UK's top 10 favourite historical fiction books. Again, I'll leave that in the cards. Um, and I don't know if it's because I was reading it for that and I was reading lots of really chunky historical fiction at the same time, but I found in places it got a little tedious. Um, it was funny, which I really wasn't expecting. It had a lot of wit and humour, um, kind of satirical, mocking political humour, which I thought was really good. The characters are really well developed and Hilary Mantel does dialogue like no one else. Um, and the historical setting was really well evoked, but there were times where it just felt a little repetitive and it dragged. And I understand that this repetitiveness is part of what happened in the history but I feel like you could consolidate it a little bit so good but not perfect is where I'm going to put that because I did have a few little issues with it 
Next we have A Registry of My Passage Upon the Earth, which actually made it into my top 10 books that I've read this year so far, um, is a collection of short stories set in different historical time periods, including uh, ancient Egypt, um, a gothic novel in, I think, like 15th century Germany, maybe it's not quite 15th century, uh, and a 20th century uh, Brazilian a story set in Brazil, all revolve around nature and the world and human interactions with the world. I still don't think it's Hilary Mantel levels good though. Even though I liked it, there was a lot of whimsy to it, it wasn't very deep. Um, there was the, the, it was more playing with like style and form and doing that very, very well. Um, but it, it wasn't exploring themes and ideas, which I think is what I need for a book to be perfect for me. Uh, I enjoyed the writing, I thought the writing was beautiful, I loved the whimsy of it, um, and I really like how all of the books all of the stories seem to tie together even though they were so vastly different i like the way he could play with different styles of writing um, and make all of them seem authentic and none of them weaker than the others um but yeah i don't think it had enough of the exploration of ideas as i would prefer no no up there then I have Kate Gren Grenville a room with made of leaves which is about a woman Elizabeth MacArthur, McAllister, something like that, who is growing up middle class in England um, and because of a mistake gets up married to this man and has to, he decides to go to Australia so she has to go with him to Australia, it's quite an abusive marriage and um, it's about the founding of Australia and the stories that were told in order to violently steal land from the indigenous people. Um, I think I'm going to put that in had potential as well. Uh, Craig Garenville is a really great writer, um, again evoked the historical time period really well and also um, was really compelling very very short chapters and it was very compelling and I kept reading I didn't want to put it down and I think I read this one fairly quickly considering it was an ebook that I read and I really don't enjoy ebooks so the fact that I felt compelled to keep reading an ebook is quite impressive for me um but I don't know if it quite handled the topic of colonialism particularly well because f it was told from the perspective of this female colonizer and it wasn't told as she was like we, she was the one we were supposed to sympathise with and see the world through and she was like not as bad as her husband and some of the other men and I just, she's like I know I was complicit in this but the the narrative doesn't kind of bring that point home um, so I wasn't sure about that aspect of it. Um, then we have A Single Thread by Tracy Chevalier and I'm gonna put this one in not my favourite. Uh, I know lots of people really love this book but I felt like it really lost its way it was overlying the violence that women face with um, the threat of the Second World War and I felt like it did it in a very clumsy way that didn't seem to work particularly well. Also the main character, the main character was very whiny and whilst I don't have to like characters I do have to find the reading compelling and not just want to be like oh, oh shut up whilst I'm reading it because it's being told from her perspective and she just really got under my skin. Um, <laughs> I think I have problem with characters who um, are well my life is rubbish but I'm just going to like Eeyore's I'm not really into reading from Eeyore's perspective um I, I I'd, evil characters I would rather read than grumbly little nothing characters mousy little boring people um, <laughs> next we've got Burial Rites by Hannah Kent and I'm gonna put that in good but not perfect I think it's almost had potential it's like the lower end of good but not perfect for me uh this is set in Iceland about the last person to uh, face capital punishment for murder in Iceland. Um, it was a woman who has been accused of the murder of these two men but we slowly hear the story as she's telling it to a priest um, and it is very much about what life would have been like in the early 19th century in rural Iceland. Um, the atmosphere is really really strong, I really love the atmosphere in this book. Um, the sort of bleakness of the atmosphere reflects the character, there's a lot of pathetic fallacy I think that that was really really strong um, and I liked the storytelling element of it. It definitely had a driving forward like impetus to the plot um, but not in a way that was like action-packed. It was very slow but still there was the sinister threat hanging over it um, and it was talking about uh, small communities, isolated places, things that I love in books always um, and I think it did that really really well. I would just say that I don't know why I would say it was not perfect. I, I, it, I think part of it is that it's not been completely memorable for me. So it's hard for me to describe why I didn't love it. If you were interested, I read it in a vlog that I will leave in the cards above. Um, but I know the feeling I have in my memory of it is that I didn't love it. Then we have Days Without End by Sebastian Barry. Again, I'm putting that in good but not perfect. Um, I'm wondering if any books will make it to Hilary Mantel levels of good um, <laughs> at the moment. Sebastian Barry, Days Without End is one of the most beautifully written books that I have read 
that I have read. Um, it is stunning. The, the writing is so beautiful and the way that it talks about colonialism. Um, it is about an Irish man who fled Ireland because of the famine and ends up in America, ends up in the army, um, in the colonial army, depossessing and murdering uh, indigenous Native American people, particularly Sioux, I think, are the main peop uh, the main First Nation that are um, mentioned in here, and then also into the American Civil War and the camps, the prisoner of war camps and the famine that happened there as well. Um, and he is also a queer person, um, and through, there are talks about gender and queerness through history and found family, um, which is all really beautiful. Some of the, I did struggle, I don't really know how I feel, how it dealt with the aspect of colonialism um, in terms of what happened in America. There is a lot of like really strong violence against Native American people in this book that's really hard to read and when it's being told from the perspective of the people who commit violence and against again you're feeling sympathy for those people. I think it's trying to do something very very complicated but I'm not sure it quite landed the jump for me. Then we have Do You Want to Start a Scandal by Tessa Dare. If you've watched my channel before you know that I am um, have enjoyed Tessa Dare's books in the past. I was reading a lot of them last year. I've read three of them this year, I think. Is it three? Yes, three of them this year. And um, Do You Want to Start a Scandal is the first book on this list that made me angry. <laughs> um, I really didn't like Do You Want to Start a Scandal. I've kind of gone off romance in general recently. I was enjoying the predictability of it last year, but this year I think that that's kind of caught up with me and I'm just no longer super interested in the stories. I've kind of got my fill of them because they are so repetitive. But on top of that, Do You Want to Start a Scandal dealt with a lot of the tropes that I really don't like. And it really surprised me because it's one of the more recent Tessa Dares. Um, it involves a man setting a fire in order to control a woman's behaviour. Um, the, the male character in this is incredibly controlling, possessive, um, doesn't allow the female lead to know anything, just does things without talking to her. It's all quite a lot of misogyny in this one and I hadn't experienced that in many of the books before. There were aspects of p um, protectiveness that went a little far but was often like explained that that was bad and they shouldn't feel that way and this one she had to forgive him in a way that felt like she was entering into an abusive relationship and I really just didn't like it. Next we have House of Stone by Navuo Rosa Tashima and this is the first book that I read for the video about reading books from Southern Africa which I'll leave in the cards above again if there are still space. I think I might have got to my maximum now um, and this is the first book that I am putting in Hilary Mantel Good. Um, this book didn't make it onto my top 10 of the year and I'm really not sure why because Register of My Passage of the Earth did but I think it's because of the way it stuck with me. It's not necessarily stayed in my brain the same way, but thinking about it, I really, really enjoyed this book. It's very dark. Um, it is about Zimbabwe, the founding of Zimbabwe, the rebellion against um, the British, and then the violent uh, genocide committed by Robert Mugabe and his forces um, during the 1980s, I think, the 70s and 80s. Um, it's, a really, it's about a man who is living as a lodger in this family's house and the son has gone missing and he knows why but he's not saying and it's kind of getting the history and the story insinuating himself with this family and we discover why and we discover the secrets of their past. It's very very dark, none of these characters are particularly likeable, they've all done bad things in their past um, but the writing is stunningly beautiful, really really beautiful. So compelling, the mystery is so compelling but at the same time you don't want to read on because you know that something terrible is going to happen on the other side. Um, I think it's a really wonderfully powerful dark book um, and it's a debut. I was so stunned that the level, this level of writing was in a debut because it is so incredibly beautifully written. Then we have Nervous Conditions by Tsitsi Dangaremga and I think I'm going to put that one in Hilary Mantel level good as well. I thought that that was just brilliant. Um, this is the first in a trilogy of autofiction, uh, again set in Zimbabwe, um, and this is about uh, the main girl who wants to get an education. Um, she doesn't have the money to go to school and she ends up, uh, but her big uncle ends up sending her to school after her brother dies. Yeah, her brother dies right at the beginning like the first line of the book you know that her brother dies um, and it's just about Zimbabwe when it was Rhodesia about the experience of living in that life um, it's written in almost a slightly detached way but in a way that worked for this book I often don't get on with books that are written in such a detached way but I thought that it was really well done in this book I thought that the the characters really felt very real and I liked the explorations of like gender or colonialism I thought it was all done in a really like subtle way that felt very real from the perspective of a, a child and teenager um and i yeah i thought it was really well written and i definitely want to read the rest of the trilogy 
Then we have Reputation by Lex Croucher, which unfortunately I'm going to put in not my favourite. As I mentioned, feeling a bit less in enamoured of uh, Regency romance anyway um, at the moment, but I was excited to read this because I thought it would be a fun escapist book and mostly I just found it overwrought, uh, melodramatic. Um, it's described as Gossip Girl meets Bridgerton and yes, both of those things are incredibly overwrought, overdramatic, unrealistic and um, campy which doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing but this didn't feel like it had the humour or fun to pull off the camp and it just felt a little on the nose um and very white like for almost written down to a younger audience which wasn't my style at all also some horrible horror historical inaccuracies like it's fine for you to use mean girls quotes altered for historical inaccuracy but please do some research about some of the things we're talking about because they sound like complete nonsense um, then we have our next Tessa Dare, which is Say Yes to the Mar Marquis. I don't really have a category in here. I think I'm going to put this in Had Potential. Uh, not my favourite Tessa Dare by any stretch, um, but I enjoyed it. Um, uh, I think this one I read whilst I was sort of slightly lessening my enthusiasm for uh, historical romance anyway, um, and I just found it a bit too predictable. Like, obviously, there is always a difficulty that gets in the way of your main capital couple being together even though they should be together I felt like that was just so flimsy in this book even more flimsy than it normally is in historical romance then we have Segu by Maurice Condé I'm gonna put that one in good but not perfect Segu by Maurice Condé this is a classic um written in the 1960s I think by Maurice Condé who is from Guadeloupe um but this is about Segu which is a town that is the head of a empire in West Africa modern day Mali um and it tells the story of four sons of this family, one of whom ends up in Brazil because of the slave trade, one of whom um, ends up becoming Muslim and travelling to Morocco, I think, and studying, one of whom stays where he was. Um, various different things happen and it kind of explores the whole of West African history in the 17th and 18th centuries um, and through their children. There are a lot of characters, a lot to remember, especially since like when the guy goes to when the guy becomes muslim he changes his name when another one of them becomes christian he changes his name so it's quite hard to keep track of who everyone is i think that's one of the reasons that it's not perfect for me um and it was very much written in a very like folklore style which works very well for the story it's trying to tell but um occasionally feels a bit distanced but i did really enjoy the story it's very much an epic saga of a story and if that's the sort of thing you're interested in i would recommend it then we have The Betrayals by Bridget Collins, which again is going, not there, is going into good but not perfect. I really enjoyed the first two thirds of this book and then I was disappointed how it ended. Um, it's about kind of a magic school in the Swiss Alps, um, but they're, everyone's like, it's like uni rather than school um, and you're training to do Le Grand Jeu, which is this game that kind of involves maths and philosophy and music and art. Like they do all these classes, but you never really see what Le Grand Jeu is. Uh, which I think worked well because I think if you'd seen it it would be disappointing um, because of all the mystery of how it's built up and it's set between two time periods and one is like the 1920s where these two boys are at school and they're kind of competitive but they're the best in the class and they get like drawn to one another and then it's set in the late 1930s when there is the rise of this fascist power um, and uh, one of the boys from the earlier one has become part of the party but then he's just left the party and been sent to go back to the school because he's disagreed with their policies um, and there is a now a woman teaching at Le Grand Jeu, uh, for the first time ever because women weren't allowed in the school at all um, and it just follows this th creeping threat of fascism and this the relationships between the boys and then this boy and this woman in the future um, and there was a twist that happened that I kind of saw coming and really wished wasn't coming and it did happen and that's kind of why it disappointed me but the uh, atmosphere the the setting was done so well and the relationship in the first section the two boys relationship and the whole setting of that like the learning of the game I thought was so brilliant um and I just wish it hadn't done the twist that it did then we have the crimson petal and the white by Michelle Faber again good but not perfect um just too long uh it's about sugar who is a sex worker in Victorian England and this man who is a manufacturer like a middle-class man who ends up seeing her and then 
their relationship into the future and we hear things from the perspective of both of them as well as from the perspective of the man's wife um and there's a lot of discussion about gender in victorian times about health uh women's health um about class all through it all very good but the ending was really ambiguous and i don't see why you need 900 pages to get to an ambiguous ending you could have cut 200 pages out of it 300 pages out of it and it would have been just as impactful perhaps more so because some of it just felt a little repetitive then we have the death of Comrade Presidents by Alain Mabako. I'm going to put this one at the top of her potential, I think, because um, this is about 1970s in the Republic of the Congo when there is a coup um, and it's told over the course of three days, the day before the coup, the day of the coup and the day after the coup of this young boy who um, is related to one of the leaders in, who has just been overthrown. Um, and we see him talking about like growing up, the propaganda that he um, has to partake in at school like singing songs about it and like swearing allegiance to flags and things like that um and then we see like also the poverty we see his life it's very much focused on this little boy there's a lot of humor and comedy through bit from it being told from his perspective although this didn't always work for me and um again i felt like it there were parts of it that just felt kind of unnecessary um but i did enjoy the character and i enjoyed the smallness of the story to tell this sort of big political story then we have Eagle of the Ninth um, by Rosemary Sutcliffe. Not my favourite, but right at the top of not my favourite. Kind of a children's book about uh, Roman Britain um, and they go up into Scotland and the tribes in Scotland um, and a Roman centurion seeing the errors of Rome, basically. Um, but yeah, it was very much, it's written in the 1950s, very much a 1950s boys adventure book. Uh, there are no women in it really and they don't have no personalities um, and it's very straightforwardly written. Not for me, but I can see how if you'd read it as a child you would like it. Then we have The Game of Kings by Dorothy Dunnett and you know what, I'm going to put this in Hollywood Mantel Good. I was going to put it in Good but Not Perfect, um, but that's just because it's so much fun and because it feels a lot lighter um, and I know I said that it doesn't deal with themes and ideas and that's why I can't put it in perfect but i really loved it and i thought it was perfect for what it was uh, it's about uh it's about someone called lyman in 16th century scotland who has been banished because the scots believe he betrayed them to the english um and then he comes back swashbuckling about and doing like raids and stuff very pirates of the caribbean um but it's really fun um the character is really fun i love how the mystery unfolds um i love all of the characters justice for christian stewart definitely didn't get what she deserved but uh the 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 villain is excellent um i just think it's a really great book really a lot of fun if you want just some romp uh madcap historical fiction then i would recommend the game of kings then we have the giver of stars by jojo moyes um i'm gonna put this in made me angry even though what it really made me was exasperated uh, <laughs> this is a story set in the 1930s in um appalachia in america about a woman from england who marries this rich man and she ends up being part of this pack horse library um and it's about racial segregation and um the violence of capitalism and mining um which are all themes that i love but my god was this badly written melodramatic and overwrought and um not really thought through um too obvious yeah i just really didn't like it kind of got on my nerves <laughs> Then we have The Illness Lesson by Claire Beams. I'm going to put that in good but not perfect. Um, this is about a woman whose father sets up this school in Massachusetts and it's supposed to teach women, teach girls, um, the same way you would teach boys. Um, but it's really about women's health um, and mass hysteria because these girls start getting this illness and um, it's about the treatment of women by doctors. And there is some very dark, sinister turns that felt inevitable from the way that the book was going the men molding young girls minds bending them to their will kind of what you would expect happens happens um and it's very dark um but really beautifully written i thought really well written then we have the old drift by namwali sepal this one goes at the very top very tippy top here of Hilary Mantel Good. I love this book. I talked about this a lot in my top 10 books of the year, which I believe I've already linked up there. So if you want to hear me talk for like five minutes about this book, I would go check that one out. Um, I really say family saga of three families in Zambia from 1904 up until 2025. I think that's as far as it goes in the future. Um, follows diff there's a, the, It begins with like a diary entry of a colonial man um, and it goes through of all these the three families three of the great grandfathers in this old drift hotel and then it goes through the grandmothers the mothers and the children's perspective and we see the history of zambia um post-colonial africa neo-colonialism techno-colonialism all of that is part of the, the the discussion of what happens in this book um brilliant characters brilliant brilliant conversations um really great dialogue 
and yeah I just really love this book I've ranted about it a lot so if you haven't seen it uh, if you haven't read it yet I don't know why you haven't if you are watching me regularly this is the book that you need to read next we have The Philosopher's Flight by Tom Miller which again I'm gonna put in good but not perfect where have I dropped it I've dropped it there we are good but not perfect I'm gonna put it this is another kind of fantasy school um situation set in historical times which appears to be something that I like um this is about an America where witchcraft exists but they call it sigillary and it's kind of a science um and women can do it men usually can't do it or can't do it as well as women um and they are like war heroes because this is set during the first world war um and it it has it's set in the university and it's about learning uh, magic and it's also about competitions and games but also it's got sort of a dark undertone because there are these people called trenchers who believe that women should be in the home and not allowed to learn anything and um, that sigil wrists are the worst thing in the world um so it it talks a lot about like gender in and the history of gender in uh, professions but also about violent anti-feminist movements um but through a historical fantasy lens um really fun really fast paced and i thought really well done then we have The Prophets by Robert Jones Jr. Again, I'm going to put that in my good but not perfect section. A little overwrought, a little overwritten, but apart from that, really, really beautifully written, really great characters, a study of these two enslaved boys who are in love, and it tells from so many different perspectives on the plantation. Um, each chapter is just a new perspective, um, and I think that very good at differentiating all the voices and doesn't do the thing that I mentioned, Days Without End, and kate granville's book do where you feel sympathy for the like colonialists um in this book you don't feel sympathy at all even though you hear from the perspective of the slave owners um it does a good job of showing you how they justify things to themselves without justifying it to you um which i think is a delicate balance but i think it's done really really well all of the characters feel really whole and the love in this book feels really powerful as well um but yes occasionally a little overwritten then we have The Raging Quiet. Um, I'm going to put that in not my favourite. YA historical about a deaf boy and a girl um, and being accused of witchcraft, written in the early 2000s, so exactly as ableist as you think it would be, and not really very well-developed characters at all. Then we have The Salt Roads by Nalo Hopkinson, which again is going in good but not perfect. Uh, this is set over three time periods, the Haitian Revolution um, in the 18th century, uh, France in the 19th century, and uh, Egypt in the 4th century CE um, and uh, the Haitian section was really really strong characters were really strong writing was incredibly beautiful the French section was pretty strong um, enjoyed the characters although it got a little repetitive and the Egyptian section felt unnecessary although I could see how it worked um, and it would have worked as a book as a story on its own I think a short story on its own would work really well but it felt so disconnected from this book and I think that was part because it wasn't introduced until halfway through and then we didn't spend as much time there at all um so it just didn't feel as developed as some of the other sections but the writing was really beautiful and it's kind of a magical realist uh uses voodoo um and the voodoo pantheon to tell this story and then we have things fall apart by chinua chebe i think i'm going to put that in hillary mantel good very short little book so much to say very packed in um it is about the history of uh, Ibo culture in modern day Nigeria um, and the um, meeting between uh, the Ibo people who, and the uh, British colonialists and Christianity um, and also about one man and his fatal flaw of um, hubris so very Greek in that feeling very like ancient um, it has a lot of literary allusions um, and, but it is also very much rooted in the culture that it is writing about then we have Those Who Are Loved by Victoria Hislop. Made me angry. The only one that I DNF'd. Very bad. Very badly written book. Very boring book. Uh, very repetitive. Written as if a child had written it. Um, this happened and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened. And we were all very sad. Just no literary merit to that whatsoever, in my personal opinion. <laughs> Tidelands by Philippa Gregory. Surprising myself. Putting in had potential thought that the atmosphere was really good really well developed really good um i thought that the setting i love a remote rural setting with water involved this is set in the south coast of britain on these i on this land where um, it disappears for half the day because the tide rises love it love some salt marshes very into that thought that um philippa gregory did a great job of setting up this um setting and of talking about what rural life would have been like for women however her characters have characters 
have her characters have personalities and thoughts and ideas and lives and then they'll just do something entirely unrelated to what that character wants to do just for her to push her plot along like it doesn't make any sense all of a sudden this calm cool woman who never shows any emotion is suddenly really angry and jealous when a man talks to someone else um yeah i just think that she is surprisingly good at writing description and unsurprisingly terrible at plot then we have tipping the velvet by sarah waters again i'm putting that in had potential higher up in had potential but this is one of the most disappointing books that I read this year purely because of how much praise Sarah Waters gets. She's like the queen of lesbian historical fiction and a really good writer of historical fiction generally. People love her work. And Tipping the Velvet was a little boring, which I was really surprised by. It was a little bit boring. It was very much more plot focused than character or description focused. That didn't really do, it did a really good job of setting up the setting of Whitstable and of the music halls where it starts, but then it pushed forwards into different aspects of what queer past would have been like. We had a section of our main character working as a rent boy on the streets of Covent Garden and then as a like live-in doll basically for this rich lesbian woman and then uh, work as a working class queer women um, kind of socialist experience um and all of those just felt a bit weaker uh felt pushed on for the plot and didn't feel as well well developed and um yeah it was just the writing itself was not my style at all it was very very plot heavy and i just don't really love a very very plot heavy book it didn't feel immersive to me and the characters felt a little bit two-dimensional so i know this is sarah waters debut so i would i'm not ruling out reading any more sarah waters but unfortunately that one just didn't cut it for me then we have Till by Daniel Kalman, and this is going up here as well in Hilary Mantel Good. So Till by Daniel Kalman is translated from the German by Ross Benjamin, and it is Till is a trickster character from German folklore who has been transported into the 17th century, the early 17th century, as part of the Thirty Years' War in Europe, which is a historical period I didn't know about, but I really enjoyed reading about in this book. It's not told chronologically at all. We jump forwards and backwards in time. There are witch trials. There is uh, bloody battles there are really weird like gormenghast courts where the winter king is not the king anymore but he's still acting as if he's the king uh, i love the character of elizabeth stewart in this the writing crazy beautiful so mad and unhinged but in such a really good way like daniel kalman is just a master writer and i really really loved this book i love the way it always felt like there was felt like there was some sort of magic on the edge but it was almost like superstition it has a dark fairy tale element to the writing and also like monty python-esque surrealism at the same time uh, and i'm not a huge monty python fan but i thought that the surrealism really worked in this book then we have Waverly by Sir Walter Scott and I'm going to put this one in had potential. <laughs> this is a classic, one of considered to be potentially the first historical fiction novel in English and I read it for the 10 UK's favourite historical fiction. Um, it is about a man who is the son of these who's the son and the nephew of these two brothers, one of whom is a Tory and one of whom is a Whig and um, the Tory kind of has Scottish leaning tendencies because of the Catholicism in Scotland um, and it's set during the early the early 18th century during one of the Jacobite rebellions um, and the son goes up as part of the British army to suppress the rebellion ends up going to meet these other Scottish people and his loyalties to England are tested um, and I enjoyed it there were some funny aspects to it but it definitely didn't feel like a modern novel at all there was loads of stuff that happened that felt really like weird tangents rolling off that happened for no reason except I suppose to explore the ideas that Walter Scott wanted to explore. I found myself very confused a lot of the time. Um, it, the thing with classic novels is that they will put bits in in Latin, German and French and expect you to just know them um, and also flipping back to notes at the back of the book I find really takes me out of the experience. So it's just a lose-lose situation for me in terms of that and also half of it was written in like scots and a mix bits of scots and bits of gallic and i i i was all right with the scots i was not all right with the gallic um so <laughs> a lot of it was just really confusing for me uh and again no women why would why would walter scott put women in books they're useless um so yeah it just didn't really jive with that one very well but i did enjoy the fact that i'd read it and the fact that i'd read it kind of illuminated some of the tropes and ideas that are used in the other historical fiction books that I read in that same vlog, um, which is in the cards if you want to check it out. 
And then finally, we have our final test of dare, which is when the Scot ties the knot. And I'm going to put that one in good but not perfect. I think that was my favourite. The only reason I'm putting it up there is because I think it was better than the other two test of dares. But I'm just not really into romance anymore. Actually, I'm going to put it down into her potential, but at the top. Um, no, it's not better than the death of Conway President. Um, anyway, I just, yeah, I'm just not really into Tessa, uh, Tessa or historical romance generally anymore. Um, it's lost its charm for me, um, unfortunately, because I like having escapist books. But as you may know, I've kind of, I'm trying to dip my toe into more like whimsical children's fiction. But again, when you don't know a genre very well, it's hard to separate the wheat from the chaff. But that is my final listing there. So the books that are Hilary Mantel good are The Old Drift by Namwali Sapel, House of Stone by Nevo Rosa Tshuma, Till by Daniel Kelman, Nervous Conditions by Tsitsi Dangaremga, The Game of Kings by Dorothy Dunnett, and Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart. My longest list there is definitely good but not perfect, but my had potential outweighs my Hilary Mantel good, which I think seems right for how I've been feeling about my books lately. Only three books that made me angry, and one of which I didn't finish. So actually I feel like that's pretty good going. Two of those I read for the same vlog, so <laughs> that was reading the best-selling historical fiction of the year. Again, it'll be up there if I can fit it. If not, you can find it in the description down below. Um, but yeah, those are that's how I feel about that. Uh, so let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of these. Do you agree or disagree with any of my rankings? Or do any of them surprise you, considering how I've talked about these books in the past? I hope you enjoyed this video. It's always a lot of fun to film. I love organising things in an order. Um, and I know that if I did this on a different day, things wouldn't necessarily end up in the same positions. But that is how I feel about them right now. If you did enjoy this video, I will leave the one that I did at the end of 2020 here. Um, and if you aren't subscribed already, I will leave a button here for you to subscribe. I would really appreciate it if you did. I put out new videos three times a week, so I will definitely see you again soon. Thank you for watching. Bye bye!